In the name of God, the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Perhaps no one in history has been as reviled and despised as Judas Iscariot. He betrayed the location of Jesus to the authorities, and they arrested, tortured, and killed him. It's hard to know why Judas did it, and despite our curiosity, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that Jesus turned on his friend, his teacher, his Lord, and for that, history has remembered him. For history is of this world, and Judas chose to belong to the world <coughs> instead of belonging to Jesus. Now, there's a little bit of Judas in all of us. Nobody likes to hear that. Nobody wants to admit it. It's a terrible thing to consider. But the temptation to sell Jesus out assails all of us. And from time to time, we name our price and give him up to the forces that seek to destroy him and us. Of course, none of us can betray Jesus in precisely the same way as Judas did. But there are moments when other things seem more important. And when we pursue those goals and go against Jesus, the little Judas inside of us takes over for a little while. When we harbor feelings of resentment, and have a lust for vengeance in our hearts. We belong to the world, not Jesus. And Judas has a chance to play. When we feel entitled and superior to others, Judas is awake and active inside us. While no one may be as notorious as Judas Iscariot, few in history have shown so much promise yet been as forgotten as Matthias and Joseph Barsabbas <clears throat> and Justus. In fact, if we didn't remind you of who they were every three years by reading this lesson from Acts, I doubt any of us would have a clue they ever existed. They were the two finalists for replacing <laughs> Judas as disciple number 12. They were chosen by 120 of the faithful based on the exacting criteria that we heard Jeffrey read. But in the end, their fate was decided not on their merits. Rather, they cast lots, trusting for the Holy Spirit to discern what was in the heart of each and which would serve as the best apostle. And the privilege and responsibility fell on Matthias. He must have been excited and terrified in equal measure. Maybe he dreamed of doing great things in the service of Jesus, and maybe he did great things. But we have no idea. Once he was selected, the New Testament never mentions Matthias again. He faded into the mist of history. We have some legends, but we can't confirm them. So we can only guess what he did and how he died. The same was true of Joseph, the runner-up. Just imagine how disappointed he felt. So close to being exalted as one of the twelve, to being promoted. Yet, he stayed an ordinary disciple, one among hundreds. Like Matthias, none of the many names by which Joseph was known ever again appear in the New Testament. We hope that he recovered from his disappointment and went on to do amazing things for the sake of the gospel. But we'll just never know. <coughs> There's a little bit of Matthias and Joseph in each of us. In our lives, there have been instances of exaltation coupled with fear and episodes where we came so close to what we wanted but fell short often for arbitrary reasons beyond our control. And much as we might like to leave a lasting legacy, 
we know that our names will most likely be forgotten, swept away by the sands of time. Oh, we want our name to endure. We want our accomplishments to be remembered and our contributions to be honored long after we are gone. That's one of the ways we quest for immortality. But the truth is that like Matthias and Joseph, very few, if any of us, will be known two generations from now. Much less 200 years or 2,000 years from now. And that's a very humbling and even disturbing thing to countenance. And that is why we need to embrace the everlasting life promised to us by Jesus. Because we do not belong to the world. Faithful Christians belong to God. And our perpetual endurance lies not in the whims of memory and history, but in the promise that our names are known by a God who never forgets. As Jesus prepared for the final decisive days of his life on earth, he prayed to God his Father. Jesus prayed for himself, as you'd expect from someone about to suffer an agonizing death, but mostly he prayed for his disciples that they might be united not by some common cause or the fickle bonds of affection, but by a spirit that would protect them from the dangers and temptations of this world. And that prayer was offered by Jesus, not just for those few of his original disciples long ago, but for all of us who seek and hope and pray for eternity to be our home. Every time we fall prey to the temptation of belonging to this world, we deny Jesus and betray him as Judas did. Every time ambition and conceit become the primary motive in our lives, we walk away from our faith. And every time we feel disappointed about the fragility of our legacy, we forget that we are not meant to belong to this world. In it, yes. Of it, no. We belong to God, the sole source for what we desire, not to be erased, not to disappear into the maw of oblivion. And Jesus has provided us with what we need, what we yearn for, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he offers us a name, not our own, a holy name that owns us, to whom we belong. This is the name we ought to cling to instead of our own or any other. This is the name that grants us an identity that will never fade, a name that embraces us without regard for our <coughs> achievements or failures, but only with compassionate regard for our faithfulness. Dwelling with that holy name alleviates our anxiety about the future. It disperses the disappointment we feel at the prospect, indeed the near certainty, of being forgotten someday. That holy name guards us against the temptation to betray Jesus by putting our own desires and opinions first. What wonderful grace that in the midst of which in this world in which we live but to which we do not belong there might arise an unforgettable name that gives us the mercy to truly belong in the only place that gives real life. Because everybody wants to feel like they belong. Nobody likes feeling lonely or isolated. Everyone wants their name to be remembered and cherished. No one wants to be forgotten or ignored. But the world will not give us this. 
It can't give us this. Only God, motivated purely by love, gives us the joy of belonging, of being known and remembered and treasured forever. This is the reality of eternal life, and every day we need to seek the grace that protects us from the dangers of this world, that protects us from temptation and guides us along a pathway of faithful discipleship that leads us to what we want and need most. And to seek and to receive this grace. To welcome the Holy Spirit into our hearts. To be bound together in love with one another and with Jesus. We need to do as Jesus did. And among the many things he did was pray. Among the many things he could have been doing, that's what he did in the crucial hour. Jesus prayed. And our prayers draw us closer to him. Closer to that sense of belonging we crave. Closer to the ever in the day we will abide with God in his kingdom that has no end. This will free us from the grasp of a world that takes much more than it gives. Perfect freedom means, ironically, to submit. To submit all of who we are to the one who made us, to the one who helps us become the people that we are intended to be, to the one who holds us together in a world full of forces that strive to tear us apart and tear us down. So I encourage you to pray. Pray like your life depends on it. Because your life does depend on it. Pray that your heart may be open to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit so that your sense of belonging will bring you joy and peace even as we spend every day in a world where belonging costs in a world where belonging oftentimes costs us our freedom and causes us to be exploited and rejoice always in the precious gift of that name above all names a name that knows us and loves us and rescues us from nothingness and grants us a realm where we can abide in peace and never die or be forgotten. Amen.